Well, welcome to the Johnson Victrola Museum. Our museum is a collaboration between the state of Delaware and the surviving family members of this gentleman here, Mr. Eldertrees Johnson. Mr. Johnson, he was born here in Delaware. Um, he grew up here in Dover. He went to school here in Dover. And that is one of the reasons why we have his memorial museum here. He actually attended the Dover Boys Academy. And upon his graduation, uh, the administrators of that school, they sort of called his family in and they sort of said, well, it's, if, you, if he goes on, he wanted to go to college, and if he goes on to college, it's probably going to be a waste of money because, to put it politely, they were basically saying that he really wasn't very bright. As you can see, you know, he turned out to really be, you know, quite a genius in, in not only in inventions, but in advertising as well and also uh, big manufacturing. He went through uh, a series of different phases, and then he finally came across um, uh, a gramophone. It was a wonderful machine, but it needed some improvements. One of the feedback that he got was that the horns were big and unsightly and they collected dust. So he decided, you know, how can we combat this fact of them being big and unsightly and collecting dust? And so he put them in a decorative wooden case, which became the Victrola. Now, by putting a horn in the decorative wooden box, there was an added benefit that came to this, and that was by opening these doors, now you, for the first time, have some element of volume control. Many of the machines were, were very expensive, and they were, some of them were luxury items. Mr. Johnson, one of his desires was to make the machines affordable to everyone because he believed that everyone should have a talking machine in their home. And so he manufactured um, models that were, that were good, substantial, sturdy talking machine models. Then there was a, a sort of a, a middle model and then there was a high-end model, which today a lot of manufacturers still have that concept. They give you, the consumers, that choice. And he was one of the first ones to come up with that choice of you know, a good item, a better item, and a high-end item. Mr. Johnson was one of the people who really made the push to incorporate music and recorded sound. It's hard for us to even imagine a, an, an environment in which there is no music or no sound because we are so surrounded by it that we just take it for granted every, you know, every day. But Mr. Johnson lived in a world in which there was no music around unless somebody was playing it live. Music was really quite a treat, and he believed that everyone should have the experience of music at all times. So that is one reason why he really had such a big push with music in the recorded sound industry. One of the things that he needed to do was he needed to have records for people to play on the machines. So he started his own recording industry. He was a pioneer. He's the one who introduced you know, the 78 records. Uh, it was the very first uh, record. Of course, by putting a spring motor into the machine, of course, enabled him then to have an automatic machine to play it. And then, two, by recording it with the records, he also, if you look at the artists that recorded for him, people like Caruso, McCormick, Tetrazzini, Melba, and then he's pioneer, and even in all types of music, such as jazz and things like that, uh, he was bringing this to the public. So he was a pioneer in it, plus the recording technique of actually improving the quality of sound was also one of his major contributions to the industry as well. Mr. Johnson, as I said, not only was he an inventor, but he was also a businessman. Probably his biggest claim to fame was his trademark, which was the little dog. It was based off of the Francis Barad painting, his master's voice. It showed a little dog, a little mixed breed terrier who was listening to a phonograph. The trademark itself, the little dog, he sort of took off on a life of his own. And he became a very big icon in his own right. And there were all kinds of items that were manufactured um, behind him. He sold the company in the late 1920s. Um, he sold the company to RCA. And RCA continued to use the logo. And it was actually um, RCA Victor for a long time, for, for a number of years. And then, Finally, RCA dropped Victor, 
but they still do use the logo. 1927, when he sold his company, he put his money into gold certificates, not into stocks and bonds. So when the stock market crashed in 1929, he did not sustain major financial losses. And of course, his family today, I think, probably is still thankful of that business decision he did in 1927. Uh, people today don't know who Eldridge Johnson is. And I think, unfortunately, that was his personality. He uh, wasn't, he never once recorded his own voice. Uh, his name, of course, is not on any of his records or his machines, it's all Victor. But he was very good, I mean, you know, we talk about, there's a painting we have here, which I think says a lot about who he was. Uh, it's basically, he gave a lot of money to different organizations and charities, although he definitely enjoyed his own wealth, of course. But he fostered a lot of business in the city of Camden, actually helped build restaurants and hotels there. So he's quite generous in his, uh, in his operations as well. Um, but he was a very devoted family man. He had, he has one wife, well, he had a wife and one son, Fenimore, and he was very close to them. And of course his son is one who's responsible for building this museum down here as well. Talk about people, I guess, who are very successful in business or whatever field they go into. He had a very inquisitive mind. And I think a man who, as I said, was considered too stupid to go to college because you know, his teachers felt he didn't really conform to the way they taught back then. But to build a success in a financial uh, successful uh, operation, but always his innovations, always thinking ahead. When you think of Victor Talking Machine Company, it wasn't just the machine, it was his records, it was his advertisements, it was his publicity, it was his marketing. He was so far ahead in a lot of things of his time. We're very privileged with having this museum here in Dover. And hopefully more and more people will get an opportunity to come to the museum and really appreciate a man, especially from Delaware, and one of, I think one of the successful people from Delaware, and to see how successful he was. And they recognize that you know, he was a man, when you hear music today, you can go back and he was a man who actually had a lot to do with the way we hear music today. <laughs>